I'm delighted to welcome uh, Nicolo Boato this evening for our speaker. He's one of our hardware engineers. Uh, he's based in London, uh, though sometimes works in Cheltenham, which is a much nicer place, I think. Uh, he's one of our, we have a, a group called the Lab as a Resource, which is basically all of our um, hardware specialists in Cheltenham, Madrid, Seattle, and are dotted around the world. Uh, Nicolo's one of that kind of elite group of hardware testers. Uh, so I'm delighted he can speak for us this evening. So please welcome Nico. Thanks very much. Thank you. I think we have a bit too much gain on this mic, but um, okay. Otherwise, I have to whisper. Okay. Uh, hello, I am Nicola Boatto. I'm a senior security consultant here at IOActive, and this is Unicorn Engine. What? Why? How? So. What is Unicorn Engine? It's a lightweight, multi-platform, multi-architecture CP emulator framework based on Kimu. It supports x86, ARM, ARM64, MIPS, PowerPC, Spark, RISC-V, pretty much you name it. Uh, it's implemented in C, but it comes with bindings for Crystal, Clojure, Visual Basic, Perl, Python, Java, etc., etc. So you can pretty much script for it in whatever language you're used to. So why use it? It can emulate pretty much anything. Uh, it allows emulation of arbitrary portions of binaries, so not just an entire ELF. You can throw it some a random shellcode string of bytes, and it will, if you map it into its memory and try to execute it, it will happily do that. Um, it gives you the ability to be extremely surgical uh, with instruction level hooking. So you're, you're able to execute a piece of code before each instruction is executed by the emulator. And it can save you huge amounts of reversing time by just executing the bits you need uh, or that you're interested in rather than reverse engineering entire firmwares, for example. You can just look at the functions you're interested in and execute them. So let's, let's dive a little deeper. So this is the how portion, which is most of the presentation is going to be about the how. Um, so, I made a little example firmware for a device uh, which pretends to execute a firmware update. So, what happens very often and is very common in, uh, in embedded uh, systems is that you have a, a, an encrypted firmware update that is going to be downloaded, decrypted, and then installed and applied as a, as a firmware update. Very often, what you find is that if you go back enough uh, if, and you find an old enough version, the firmware update won't be uh, encrypted. And maybe that version of the firmware update will contain the decryption uh, functionality. Um, and usually, uh, what you find is that rather than having a, an actual proper key, uh, you'll have a key that is hard-coded in the firmware and is uh, then just obfuscated. So you have some, some bytes that are stored somewhere. They'll go through a bunch of functions that just jumble up this, uh, these bytes. Um, they they deobfuscate them and then use the, the results of that uh, to, to decrypt the, the firmware update. So in this case, uh, we have a firmware update. It doesn't actually update anything. It's just this string that you see on screen. Uh, if you want to try and do it uh, in your head, uh, we'll see if I'm faster with the presentation or you are. So. How do we do this? We pop the firmware image into our reverse engineering tool of choice. Uh, I've used Ghidra in, uh, in this case. Uh, we'll look for the interesting functions. Um, we'll build our emulation environment around the, the functions that we're interested in emulating. Uh, so then we'll run the emulation, check results. It will probably break at some point. Uh, we'll, maybe some function is not happy with the, uh, the environment. Maybe Something needs to be mapped at a certain in a certain memory area. Maybe uh, there is there needs to be some environment or maybe some coprocessor that needs to to exist for the um, for the firmware to to run properly. Uh, so what we do is we make some changes, uh, try and make the functions happy, try and make the 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 code happy, uh, and then repeat until we get to our result. What this allows us to do is to break down the reverse engineering into individual problems. So rather than keeping in mind a billion different parameters, uh, what's going into this function, this function might then, depending on its input, 
uh, it has maybe a switch case and it has a thousand different cases and depending on the input, it'll select the case and run different logic and then call different sub functions. It can get very com complex very quickly. So rather than uh, keeping all of this in mind, we can just let the code do its thing. Like we, we don't need to reverse engineer everything. We can just know what the function does more or less give it the input and see what the output of the function is. So let's dive into it and, and see what I mean. So in this case, we have this uh, this firmware that I wrote, and this is the, the main function for it. Uh, can you kind of make out what it says on screen? OK. So you'll see this is the main function. We have a bunch of uh, functions that initialize stuff. So you initialize the GPIO, um, the I squared C, I squared S, uh, SPI, USB does a lot of initializing hardware, which in this case, if we're emulating, we, won't, we wouldn't have. Um, then we can see here that there's a do upgrade function. And if the do upgrade function is, is successful, uh, firmware updated successfully. So let's dive a little deeper. So here's the do upgrade function. Uh, we see it has a bunch of variables are declared at the top. Um, and we get a firmware download size. It allocates some space for that firmware. Um, to be stored. We have a firmware download, which doesn't actually happen. Um, then we uh, get the update size after decryption, allocate some space for that. And then finally, we have another uh, length of the firmware that is got calculated. But then we have the important part, which is the decrypt firmware function. So let's have a look at decrypt firmware. So we can see the function takes the encrypted firmware, the input size, and then there's a uh, space for a decrypted firmware uh, and, uh, and the output size. So here you can see there's, actually, let's zoom in a little bit. Um, you can see that there's an AES context that gets initialized. Uh, so we allocate uh, hexadecimal 118 bytes. If the encrypted firmware is, um, is null or the input size is 0, um, we'll return minus one and then we'll error out. Else, we'll get the IV, get the key, uh, initialize the AES context, uh, wh then we'll set the key in this context, uh, and then we'll do the, we'll, we'll perform the decryption of the firmware. So let's, let's dive a little deeper. This is what the get firmware IV function looks like. It's, it's nothing too complex, but it's, uh, you can see there's, there are 16 bytes here. We don't know what those are, but um, you know, they are there. And those, those 16 bytes get passed on to the SHA-256 function. And then we mem copy the first 16 bytes of the output uh, into the, the IV that we passed to the, the, the IV buffer that we passed to the function. Here's the get firmware key function. It has uh, two buffers. One is the encrypted key buffer, and one is the super key, super secret key encryption key. So we have um, <clears throat> we have the bytes for for the super secret key encryption key, and we have the encrypted key. And then this gets passed to the super secret encryption function, uh, and somehow we get a key out of it. So let's have a look at this super secret encryption. Uh, the super secret encryption is made up by two sub function. We have the KSA and the PRGA, so the key scheduling algorithm and uh, pseudo random generation algorithm. I already, I think I heard someone say the right thing from the, from the crowd, but um, the key scheduling ar algorithm looks like this. Uh, it's, it's a little complicated, um, and this is what the pseudo random generation algorithm looks like. Uh, Someone might have uh, caught that the f that this is just RC4, but in in other in other situations, this might not be RC4. And I've, I I know for a fact that some people reverse engineered RC4 before because they didn't recognize it off the bat. So in a situation where you have this and it's not RC4 and it's some custom decryption algorithm or deobfuscation algorithm, you would have to spend time re-implementing this either in C, Python, or just try and emulate parts of, of the firmware somehow or emulate the entire firmware. But usually, you just take the, the decompiled code and try and re-implement this so you can repeatably decode uh, firmware updates. So this is complicated. Let's do it the easy way. 
So again, let's look at the decrypt firmware function. We, we, need, we just need the encrypted firmware and the input size for it to be happy and to start doing its job. Uh, then we know that after get firmware IV and get firmware key, um, by the end, by, by the time these functions that get executed, somewhere in memory, we will have both the IV and the key that we need to decrypt uh, the firmware update. So in this case, obviously there's many ways to skin a cat. You can, you can intercept this data anywhere. Uh, but let's say I, will, I want to hook the AES set key uh, and the AES crypt functions uh, to actually get the key and the IV that I'm interested in. So let's actually do this the easy way. So here's uh, a bit of Python that I wrote to use a unicorn engine. So here is just the, the main function. We are loading a trace file, which I'll show you later. It's, it's helpful in, in tracing what is happening during the emulation. Now we're opening the ELF uh, of the, the firmware. Uh, in this case, it's an elf with symbols just to make my life easier, but I've applied this to um, just strip binaries and it, it works just the same. Uh, we know that the decrypt firmware function is at this address, and uh, so we set it as the emulation start, and we want the emulation to end once we have everything that we're interested in. Uh, so we'll just print initializing emulator and run the init emulation function. This in emulation function looks like this, and is again more code that I wrote, where we we take the elf that was read from from disk, uh, we uh, instantiate a new unicorn object. In this case, uh, we we set the architecture to ARM because I know that the target for um, for this elf was uh, ARM, and you can see it's an uh, unicorn mode M class, so it's a Cortex M. We start uh, by mapping some memory regions. So we, we map the stack from its base and, and its size. We, we map the heap. Uh, we set an initial stack pointer. So from, the, from high addresses, we, so we can, we can go down. Um, we write uh, to the stack pointer register. So you can see mu.regwrite. So we're writing to a register. We can write to the stack pointer. So unicorn arm register stack pointer. We write this initial stack pointer. Then we have this life binary. It's, um, it's, I, I use the life library to parse the elf so that I could get the location of different functions. Uh, this is not necessary. It was, again, to make my life easier just because this was only for the sake of the demo. So it gives you an idea of how you would do this. But if you have symbols, you can use life and, and parse, uh, par parse the symbols and, uh, and know where the functions are and the address of each function. Uh, okay, so through life, uh, I can find, uh, I can parse the ELF and find the offset of each section of the ELF. So in this case, the ISR vector, the, the text, and the RO data sections. Uh, I just needed the ISR mostly to know from which point uh, to, to start. So it's, a, it's an offset so that I know that I can load the text and the RO data into the memory of the emulator. So what I did here is then I mapped a single memory block. So I have this, uh, I again map more memory. So you can see mu.memmap. I'm mapping um, at the location of elf base. I'm resizing to block because um, Unicorn Engine only allows you to map memory in uh, page increments. So I'm resizing this to the correct block size. Uh, so I'm giving myself a little bit extra. Uh, then I'm seeking into the file and writing this, uh, writing this um, into memory. So you can see I'm writing, for example, uh, mu.memwrite at the text address. I'm writing the text section of the of the elf. So in, in this this way, I'm I'm slowly bit by bit building what the execution memory should look like. So we know that the the, the functions and overall the the binary expects stuff to be at a specific address, and we're putting things in that specific address so that we can then execute it. So we return the emulation. Uh, this, uh, this is, again, how the decrypt firmware function looks like. We, we see we, we need to make, make it happy. We need to have the encrypted firmware not be null, and we have, the, have to have the in size not be zero. And then we'll, we'll have this, the get firmware IV, get firmware key functions will run. Uh, then we have the set key, 
um, sorry, the, we're initializing the AES context, and then we have the functions that we're interested in, in hooking. So this is the hook code function. Uh, this, this bit of, uh, of Python gets run each time a new instruction is run. So what we do here is, well, uh, get, the, get the function name. So what, what I've, uh, I've done is uh, write a small function that depending on which address we're running uh, at, it will tell me uh, what the name of the function is. This is because we have symbols and it, you know, it, makes, it makes the trace look a little, a little cleaner. We have this little bit of, uh, of uh, trace uh, code, which allows me to print out the individual registers at each function if I want, uh, or at each um, instruction, or just disable it altogether so that the execution just, just happens. And af uh, afterwards, we have this function substitution block. This is the, the crux, and I think the core and the most important part of, of the entire code. So if the address is the address of malloc, for example, and we can get this by life binary dot get symbol. So th this is we get the address of malloc plus one because we're running in thumb mode. Uh, in thumb mode, uh, arm um, to identify the fact that uh, an arm CPU is running in thumb mode, the least significant bit of the address will always always be one. So. The, the symbol will have whatever address and then a zero, for example. While executing, that zero will be a one because the, the least significant bit is going to be set to one if we're running in thumb mode. So in this case, if the address is the address of malloc plus one, we'll run this other function that I, that I wrote. Same for SHA-256 and the embed set key and uh, AES script functions that I mentioned earlier. So let's look at these functions and what they do. Oh, first of all. The trace file that I mentioned earlier. So this is how that looks. So we are tracing instruction at this specific address in the function decrypt firmware. And we can see this is what the stack pointer is, the program counter, and then um, registers R0 through R4. Uh, same for malloc. So we, you remember in the function we have decrypt firmware, then calls malloc. So we can see that right after malloc gets called, and then we go back to decrypt firmware. And we can see what each of the registers looks like, and we can see how they are, they're being manipulated by, uh, by the individual instructions and by the individual functions. So getting into the function substitutions. This is my substitute SHA-256 function. What I'm doing here is because SHA-256 required a whole environment to exist and stuff to be initialized. And sometimes uh, if, it's, it's a crypto, if it's crypto code, it would require maybe a crypto coprocessor. Um, it would break. It would just go down a longer and longer and longer call chain until something would be called and that would break the, em the emulation. So I know what SHA-256 is supposed to do. Why don't I just take the input run SHA-256 from a random, like the, the default Python library, put the result where it's supposed to go, so in the correct register, and, uh, and just you know, return from the function rather than, uh, than have this whole function execute. So we'll, we know that in R0, there will be the input address. So we go, we, we execute emu.regread, emu arm register R0. So we're reading register R0. We're storing that in input address. Uh, we're storing the input length, uh, that, is, that is in R1 in input length. And then we're reading memory, so mu.memread from input address, which was in R0, and the of length, input length, which was in R1. And we have the input of the SHA-256 function. Then we just execute hash lib, which we imported, uh, .sha-256 of the input, and we get the digest of it, and uh, that is our hash. Uh, we can print that out to, to the console output. And then we can take this output address, which was in R2. We can, again, mu.registerread in R2. And mu.memwrite, so we're writing memory at the expected output address. We're writing the hash there. Now there's this trick that you will see in all of the other functions is, how do I make the emulation skip function execution altogether? So rather than... Uh, going through the entire function and then returning. Um, how do we achieve just returning to the previous function and skipping a function altogether? 
what I'm doing here is calling mu.regwrite and I'm writing the program counter. What I'm writing to the program counter is mu.regread link register. So when a function is called in ARM, the return address of that function is, um, is stored in LR in the link register. And because the hook code is executed before the instruction, we can just, once this, once this is called, swap out the program counter. And instead of executing next, whatever function was, was next, we'll just continue executing from the link register. So instead of entering the function and executing, we're just entering and jumping right out. But because we did all these other things before, we're entering and jumping right out, but we also changed the environment as if the function actually had executed. I'll give you a couple more examples. This is my malloc implementation. Because malloc required uh, some other um, environment to exist and it expects things to be, um, to be allocated in a specific way, uh, it would sometimes break. It actually would break most times. So rather than just using the, the built-in malloc, I just wrote my own. And all it does is, I know that I have a specific bit of memory. All it does is read, uh, read from the register, R0, the, the size that we, we want to allocate. It calls internal malloc, which all it does is allocate things linearly. Uh, we just know that we have free space and enough free space for this, this whole uh, emulation to run, for all the allocations to, um, to exist. So we're just allocating things one after the other and just returning the address of the next bit uh, of the next byte that we know is gonna be is gonna be free. So you see, we have the a heap pointer. All we're doing is doing uh, is storing the heap pointer, uh, adding the new size, adding the size to the heap pointer, and and changing that and returning the address of the original heap pointer. So whenever this function is called next, whenever internal malloc is is called next. The it will uh, again the the heap pointer will point to new empty space and this will keep being allocated linearly. Once this returns, we write to the register R zero the address uh, of the of the space that we've allocated, and then we do the same LR to PC trick to return from malloc as if it was called. Well, it was called, but it was mine. Um, so it, we we never executed the original bits of firmware. We just executed my code. So more function substitutions. In this case, we're, we're getting to the juicy parts. So those two previous functions, I had to substitute in order to stop the emulation from breaking. It took a few minutes, still a lot less time than reverse engineering the whole thing. But once you've set everything and you, you see, oh, it, it's broken, let me go back and see why it broke. It broke because of SHA-256. OK, let's just swap my own implementation, and it'll keep running. Oh, it, wrote, it broke because of malloc. OK, I'll write my own malloc and, and, and keep going. Now we're getting to the, to the interesting part. So we, this is where um, we, set the key in, um, we set the key for the decryption of the firmware. So we can see that um, in R1, if you remember the function from earlier, the key gets passed as the second uh, parameter to the function. So it's stored in R1. And you, we can just reg read. Um, R1, and that's the key address, and we know that the key is going to be 32 bytes. So we go, uh, we, we execute mu.memread, um, and we read from key address. We read 32 bytes, and we know this is going to be the key. So we print it. Uh, we do the same PCLR trick to return from the function directly, because again, we don't need to set the key in the um, in the environment, because actually, we, we this, the environment doesn't doesn't exist. We allocated space for it, but the, the, the entire function was skipped altogether elsewhere. Uh, so all we're doing is entering the function, intercepting the stuff that we're interested in, and returning. Uh, same here with the AES script. We know that in R3, we have the IV. So we re uh, read the IV address from R3. We put it in, in we, we store in IV address. We read 16 bytes, which is the length of the IV, into the IV, um, IV variable. We print it out, and again, LR goes into PC, and we skip the function altogether. OK, now that we substituted, oops, now that we substituted the, the functions and we're pretty much executing whatever we want whenever we want in the code, uh, 
let's do the final bits to make the environment um, as the function expects, uh, and then start the execution. So we'll set the application flags on uh, for ARM, uh, the APSR, uh, to all Fs. We'll set, set the um, thumb mode, uh, we'll enable thumb mode, so we're we'll right to the CPSR register, uh, hexadecimal to zero. Then remember, the decrypt firmware function would return immediately if the if the firmware was null and if the length was zero. So we need to make that function happy. We could just start executing a little after the check, but this is just to show um, show how to get this get this running. So we get the the initial string from earlier. I don't know if anyone decrypted it uh, in their mind uh, by now, but uh, from hex we get this. Uh, we we store it in firmware. Uh, the size is the length of firmware, and we um, we use the internal malloc. We have it. Why not uh, to actually store it into the heap? Um, and we go. We we execute uh, mu dot mem write the firmware address. At the firmware address, we'll store the firmware. So just the string, and this is how we set up the registers for decrypt firmware. So in R zero, remember we have the firmware address which is now stored in the heap. We have, in R1, we have the firmware size. And then R2 and R3, we don't really care because this stuff is used afterwards. Like, by the time this is used, we already have the key and we already have the IV. So we, we, don't, we can set them to whatever, I just set them to zero. So we have a try block. Uh, we'll uh, write the emulation start in, um, in the program counter. Uh, we'll add the hook, so the the hook func uh, the hook code that that you saw earlier. We'll add that as the as the hook that gets executed before each each function, and then we can just uh, start the emulation. So mu dot uh, emulation start uh, from emulation start to emulation end, and theoretically, if we run this, it will start the uh, the execution and will gracefully end the emulation at the mu end address. And, and stop and save the environment as is. So once that is done, we can collect whatever we want from the environment and make changes. Uh, if you see the afterwards, I run the decrypt firmware function, the decrypt, uh, I pass the, the firmware uh, to decrypt so that I can use the key and IV that I collected earlier to perform the decryption. So let's have a look, it's demo time. Pray, pray to the demo gods. Uh, if you if you want here, you can see the the code. You can see um, the the stack base, all the addresses that I mentioned earlier. Can you see it? Yes, yes. Um, the block size that I mentioned earlier. We have a few tracing bits. Uh, the initialize emulation function. Uh, so a little bit of the code. This is how I print the registers. So this is this is the entirety of of the code to perform that. 284 lines, not that complicated. So let's uh, press play and hope that it runs. So you can see, oh, initializing emulator, building symbol table. Uh, we can see malloc was called to store the firmware. Uh, the emulation started. Malloc was called again to store the AES context with hexadecimal 118. Um, the SHA-256 input was not really secret. The SHA-256 output is that thing, um, we have the key that we intercepted during execution. We have the IV, which is the first half of the SHA-256 output. And then emulation ended, decrypting secret. And the secret is unicorn for the win. So demo worked. And here is in case the demo broke. You can see the same output a little bit better uh, with pretty colors. And uh, that's it. Questions?